Well, good morning. Welcome to everyone who's here, worship, ready to worship with us this morning, and to those of you who are watching on the live stream, welcome. Let's all stand together and worship our Heavenly Father. We're going to sing, Because of Your Love. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom, forever will change. Because of your love. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed because of your love. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed. Because of your Well, good morning. I've got some announcements to share with everyone. So uh, we've anticipated that it could be a small crowd today in person just because of the extreme heat that we're experiencing here in Portland. And it's, so it's fun and exciting for me to look out and see some faces here. So that's kind of fun. But I do want to um, bring your attention to a few things. One, um, if you've been following along with some of the uh, announcements that have been made here in Oregon, um, we are anticipating that this will be our last Sunday of needing to observe the social distancing and COVID restrictions that have been put in place. According to the announcements, uh, Oregon is planning to lift those restrictions statewide for the vast majority of businesses and, and applications, including churches, um, starting the first. And so that would be next Sunday would be our, um, our first Sunday of doing that. And sticking with our policy that we've chosen during this time, we will continue to honor those recommendations. And so um, you're invited to come and join in with us uh, next week in celebration. And uh, we're going to enjoy that freedom. Of course, we also want to be respectful. If there's anyone who wants to continue um, for whatever personal reasons, maybe there's a greater risk level, whatever the concern may be, we want to honor that both here and 
allow for people to have uh, personal space, as well as if you choose to continue to connect in with us uh, through convenience or because you think it is the safest for you uh, through our live stream, that will continue to be offered as well. So uh, we're excited about that. I know my kids are excited and many of us are happy to, uh, to see things progressing that direction. Also want to invite you, um, we had a, a slight schedule change. Next week we will have a special uh, moment at the beginning of our service um, to show some respect and some honor. So uh, if you've seen those announcements go out during this week, um, that's going to take place next week and we would love for you to, to be here and participate in a special way in the beginning of the service. Couple other things coming up. Um, Multnomah Holiness Camp is coming up soon. You maybe saw a slide up this morning. Would it encourage you if you are come, uh, planning to come and participate, particularly during the daytime hours and instead of just the evening service at, at seven o'clock, um, we would love for you to fill out a registration. This has been such a strange year that it would be very helpful to have an idea of who is planning to attend, especially if you have children or youth in your group that might be attending. That would really help us plan for those teachers and instructors who are gonna be helping with those programs. Um, so I believe there's still some registration forms available out on the table. Please grab one of those. If you're at home and you're still considering that, uh, by all means call, we, we'll chat with you and, and let you know um, how you can how you can get that information let's see oh fun thing as we head into prayer uh, I was very thankful I was able to have a brief phone conversation with Ken Linlin yesterday um, who's been in the hospital very sick with COVID um, and he was looking at the possibility of possibly coming home today um, there's been quite a bit of damage on his lungs, so he's still using oxygen at this time, and they're not, they haven't finished assessing how long that will be necessary or if that may be a permanent change for his life. But when I talked to him yesterday, he was thrilled to be looking at the possibility of coming home, although he also mentioned he wouldn't mind staying one more day in the nice air conditioning of the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're rejoicing with Ken and Kathy that they are experiencing some improvement and, and for that hope that they have. You may be aware of other prayer requests and needs and joys and celebrations. And so let's take this time as has become our tradition at the beginning of the service to quiet ourselves, to lift our hearts before the Lord, to seek his presence and to uh, let go of the things that have been hindering us and holding us uh, back and, and to give him glory. And in just a moment, I'll, I'll speak again and close us in prayer. But let's take some time silently to pray. Lord, thank you for calling us together and allowing us to gather together as your church, your people, your assembly. Lord, thank you for giving us your word, for preserving for us your instruction and your way 
the examples of the past and the testimony of how you have worked through history to reveal your redemptive plan and to put it into place and to transform life after life after life. God, thank you that you are still alive. You are on the throne. You are King of kings and Lord of lords and nothing has shaken or dislodged that. You are Lord and, and we will be reckoned to you. God, may you give us wisdom through your word today that we might run the race of life well, that we might look to you as our Lord and Savior, the maker of all things, the one who knows what is right. And rather than fighting against you in our brokenness, our selfishness, our corruption of sin in our nature, Lord, may we look to you for a whole new nature, a transformed life, a freedom from the junk that has held us back. God, may we be living testimonies to the world, to our children, our grandchildren, to our friends and neighbors and, and co-workers and the people that we meet as, our, as we go on our way, that they might see not arrogance and pridefulness, but that they might see that you are true and real and that you can do a great work in a person's life. Truly, Lord, if you can... If you can transform each of us, if you can free us from the sinful monsters that have clung to our lives, then you can do that for anyone. God, may the world know your grace and come to love you the way that you have taught us to love you. Thank you, Lord. And we praise you for this time. And may you inhabit our praise and worship this morning. In your name. Amen. And please stand once again. Let us worship our Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. 
Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, precious Lord. Reveal your heart to me, Father, hold me, hold me. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. Lord.
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Nathan will come share today's message. As we're getting ready to head to prayer and as we were singing that song, um, I was reflecting that um, that name of Jesus, when we say how wonderful it is, how powerful it is, we're not speaking of mere audible tones of a set of letters that make a name and how it sounds to our ear. While we have come to love that name, what we're speaking of is the meaning of the name, the one who saves, the savior of the people. He, he is our Lord. He is our champion. He is our life. He is our savior. And truly, he is powerful. He is wonderful. He is worthy of our praise and our adoration and sweating in the heat. <laughs> he is worthy. In the name of Jesus, would you pray with me as we begin? Lord, thank you for this opportunity, such a precious opportunity to be gathered in community, to share love for one another, yes, but a, a unity in love and obedience and adoration of you, the one who saves the vast variety of sinners just like us. God, you are worthy of our praise. Thank you. Thank you for receiving our worship. Thank you for hearing our heart's cries. Thank you for not harding, hardening yourself against our prayers and our weeping and our turmoil, but loving us. Loving us before we were even seeking after you. Lord, thank you for calling into our darkness and sharing with us the plan of salvation, the call to repentance, the name of Jesus that we might call upon and know you and come to dwell with you and have your spirit dwell within us. Lord, may we be mindful of the path that you have set us on. And as we read this morning and and challenge our hearts with your word. May we run this race well, purposefully, intentionally, with our eyes to the prize. Lord, truly, you are the pearl of great price. You are worth our everything. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May you raise up your people today in your name. Amen. If you would look with me here in just a moment to the word of the Lord, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 today. It's not a long chapter, so we're going to, we're going to go ahead and read through all of it and then uh, pull out our, some observations from it. Ephesians chapter 3. As you're turning there, I've already alluded to a couple of times because it's on my heart and mind. Um, but there is well-known reference here to running a race. And we are in a season. H how many of you have some interest? Maybe you'll turn on the TV and catch some of the Olympic Games coming up uh, in this next month. A few of you? Okay, a couple are saying yes. Uh, so that's a, a current reference point that we might have. I wondered this morning as I was stepping out into the heat at 8 o'clock this morning and going, oh, this is going to be fun. Uh, how many of us just are thrilled and excited about the idea of talking about running and racing? Doesn't that just sound good right now? To step out and go for a good, you know, 100-degree jog? <laughs> Maybe not... <laughs> 
what is the most on our minds and our hearts. Uh, some of us are, are to an age where um, the thrill of going for a run isn't there anymore. There is only the concern of how quickly we may hit the pavement or how long it's going to take to recover from the aches and pains this time. May not be our favorite subject, but it's an important subject that the Apostle Paul brings up in several places in his writings, but today we're going to anchor ourselves here in Philippians. Here's a quick overview, just a one-sentence little look. Paul gives us a glimpse that life in Christ, what it means to live and move and walk with him and run in obedience, is, is a lot like running a race in which his people are pressing on toward victory. And that's really our key anchoring theme this morning. This idea of perseverance, which we've talked about. Oftentimes when we talk about perseverance of the saints, we're talking about dealing with trials and tribulations and even, even some form of persecution that may arise. But here we're talking about setting a mindset having a grittiness of spirit, having a determination, recognizing who Christ is and what he has done. And because of that, truly he has proven himself worthy of all that I am. All of my energy, all of my attention, all of my striving to become narrow-minded in the most appropriate, healthy way, <laughs> to be focused on the great prize that is before us, the great hope that we've been given, the great gift that we've been offered, and that is worth pushing through and laying aside the, the, the temptations, the encumbrances, the things of this world to press forward with Christ. Well, let's look to what the Word says, and, and things will begin to come into focus. Let's read down through Philippians chapter 3 together. Um, take a look as, as I read here. Um, I don't always remember to say this, but just I'll let you know that I'm reading out of the New American Standard uh, version this morning, so if, if that's a help to you, excellent. If that's slightly different than what you're reading, it's kind of fun to compare as we go along. We read, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of their surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, 
not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained it or that or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many are as perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. We'll stop our reading there. Paul is going to lead us on a journey of challenge and encouragement here. And so we have three key points, and then I'll bring some kind of some verse-by-verse -verse, um, observations as we go here. The first one, we are to run the race without hindrances. Without a bunch of baggage, which, without a bunch of things that we're trying to hold on to and cling to and trust in. Um, <laughs> this last week I drug my family up into the Mount Hood National Wilderness and took them on their first family backpacking trip. Something I've grown up with and enjoyed, but not something that my wife and daughter had experienced. And they did a great job. I'll tell you that. We're home safe and sound. We had a great time together. When doing something like that, it takes a lot of effort and physical work. And the goal is to take just what you really need. Yeah, there, there are going to be needs along the way, but you want it to be as light and as easy to carry and as meaningful as as important as possible because a mile or two into that walk up a steep mountain with difficulties and unforeseen obstacles what seemed so important and so valuable and so precious at the bottom of the hill begins to feel like something holding you back and tearing you down I brought these as an example to use a different metaphor. Oh. These are 10 pound weights, right? What do we affectionately refer to these as? Anybody know? 
You had dumbbells. Isn't that lovely? Um, which sometimes we feel like when we grab hold of them. These seem super important. In fact, they can have a certain value in our lives. Right? We see them as beneficial to our health if used properly and not just used as a paperweight or a decoration in the corner of the room, right? But when entering into a race, what fool takes the dumbbell along? What Olympic swimmer dives into the pool wearing baggy sweatpants and a sweatshirt and expects to win, expects to receive the prize. Paul starts us off in verse 7 here. I'm jumping down to. He has finished talking about the values of the day and the tendency to put the focus on the law and how well someone followed the law and observed it, that that was their, in a, it could be seen pridefully as kind of a status, but that was their assurance of how likely they were to be saved, of how well they were loved or looked upon by God. And so Paul walks through a bunch of examples, I'm not going to go through that whole section, about his life and saying, okay, if that's what we're looking at, I would be doing great. But I've set that aside, I've counted that loss. That's a bunch of, and he uses a strong word, I think my translation referred to it as rubbish, right? Right? The term there is a vile term. It's, it's waste. It's filth. It's that which is to be looked upon with disdain and disgust and gotten rid of because it's destructive and filthy and, and not desirable for our lives. So that's, that's all that, that measures up to. Trying, trying to be good enough in myself. Trying to be spiritual enough. It, 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 isn't, it isn't going to really help us in the real race that is before. He says, lay off the hindrances. So I want to start our first point up here from verse 7 and 8 is to ask, what do we hold on to? What do we cling to? What seems so important to us in this life? Ideally, yes, I know the right, good Sunday school spiritual answer that you're supposed to have in your heads right now is, well, I'm holding on to Jesus. And I hope that's really true. I believe, for many, that that is true. But there tends to be there tends to be a pull towards, well, I'm clinging to Jesus and. What's your and? When we examine the things that we hold on to, <laughs> that we carry with us along the way, are they hindrances to us, like Paul's talking about? Or do they really help? There are things that help, right? There are things that we should cling to, not for our salvation, not as our deliverance, not as our hope, but there are things that are helpful along the way. God invites us to live in good relationship with people, right? He... he there are many good gifts and things in our lives. Uh, this is not some minimalist sermon of you can't have any attachments to anything in this life. But we need to, like a good athlete, evaluate them with great scrutiny. 
of what is truly important and worthwhile and valuable, what helps us as opposed to hinders us. Oftentimes with, uh, with youth kids, as we go through certain portions of scripture, it'll bring up the question, well, am I allowed to have non-Christian friends then? Do I need to get rid of my friends who don't believe in Jesus? Am I only supposed to be all church all the time? Right? Sort of question. And there's good wisdom that parents should use in those situations that still applies to the rest of us. When we're looking at our relationships, God does not call us to jettison from the world and abandon it in the sense of not caring about the lost or removing ourselves from relationship. But there's this important standard, right? We teach it to children. It's true for our lives, too. Who is influencing who? in the relationship? Is God working through you and having an influence in the world? Or is this an avenue in which there is something clinging to that sinful nature of your life and pulling you back into the world, into the muck and the mire, into the entrapment, leading you back into sin? It's a very simple question. It's not a fun one to answer a lot of times. Who's influencing who? Okay, let's move forward. In verse 9, I can find it here. He's He's mentioned in 8, leaving aside, counting, counting the stuff rubbish, letting go of the things that aren't truly helpful. Then he says, and may it be found in may, <laughs> sorry, that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God and on the basis of faith. There's something that I want to bring up which historically has been called the righteousness of the saints. And I know I'm using saints on purpose because I know how out of style that is these days. Paul is saying that the culture, the world around him, is calling perfection of works, adherence to the law, being a good person, doing the right things, um, uh, checking off, making sure they abide by all the rules and all the regulations. That's what his world called Righteousness. That what, that's what made you right with God, in right relationship, in right harmony with God. And he's saying that's, that's not it. He doesn't say there's no such thing as righteousness. Put that out of your mind. You'll never be right with God. You'll, you can't be good enough. We use that phrase a lot of times. It can be useful, but it's dangerous when we just stop there and say, you can never measure up to God. Because we leave it as a, therefore, don't put your energy into anything. Right? You can't do it. So unless God just steps in and, and takes away sinfulness and habits from you tomorrow, well, I... I guess he didn't love you enough. He didn't care about you enough. He hasn't done it yet. You're just going to have to wait until someday you wake up all better. That, that's not what we mean. There is a righteousness. A real righteousness. A real rightness in relationship with God. But it doesn't come through how good we are. It's not something that's earned and achieved and built and bought and fought for like we think of. 
What does he say here in verse 9? What is the righteousness that he's holding to? Or where does it come from? It's the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus. That's a very different picture from doing as many good things and keeping track of it and being very careful not to do the bad stuff. That's a very different picture and example than there's one that I've been invited to come to and know and spend time with. And the more I trust them, the more connected we are. The more like them I become. I remember observing other young relationships and experiencing in my own young relationship as a foolish dating young man. There is a tendency as we are infatuated and value someone else to pay extra close attention to their mannerisms, their phrases that they use, the things that they value. And over time, we begin to have a very similar language, don't we? We begin to anticipate how they look on certain subjects, what they're going to think about it. Now I'm completely whooped. There's just certain, and I say that with pride, there are certain things I do in my household in anticipation of that's just how we do it around here, and if we were to trace it back, it's because my wife likes it that way. There's no moral reason necessarily. It's not a commandment of law or any such thing. We just do it that way in my household because I love my wife and she likes it that way. There is a coming together. There is a similarness. When we are in relationship with Christ and valuing him and spending time with him and listening to what he's saying and drinking it in, we start looking more and more and more like him. It's a wonderful, mysterious work that the Holy Spirit does in our life. He transforms us. He changes us. And that's not because God has given the law, which he has given us law, so that we can understand the difference between right and wrong. We can understand the difference between his perspective and the perspective of the world. But trying our best just to follow that law is never going to be the same as the righteousness and holiness that he desires in us which can only come through knowing him through being with him through having conversation with him of where your perspective and his perspective don't line up and coming from to the place where you Actually submit your own heart and say, either I see what you're talking about, Lord, and so I'm going to choose that way, or just as equally true sometimes, I don't get it. I don't see it that way right now, Lord, but I trust you, and so I'm going to choose to do it anyway, even though it feels counterintuitive to me, even though it's not what I'm tempted to value right now, I value you, and so I'm going to choose my behavior accordingly. Relationship makes the difference. There is a righteousness of the saints. So let me ask you something that I know is not popular in this day and age. Are we saints? Are you saints? Are you the redeemed of Christ who have truly been bought with an overwhelmingly high price and in that value in that appreciation are you coming to him and willing to set aside your own will for who he is if so without pride or arrogance you can rest in the confidence 
that you have been made right with Christ. It's not about a checkoff list. It's not about the law. It's are you pursuing him? Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about becoming like Christ in verse 10. I've said most of what I've intended to say, but let's take a peek at it real quick. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In relationship with Christ, we see here identifying with Christ. And I think sometimes here, we're pretty happy with two-thirds of this list. Or maybe less. Knowing him and the power of his resurrection. How many of you are excited right there? One, that's a pretty cool event. Somebody resurrected from the dead, right? But far more than that, the implications of that, that through that he has conquered death and sin and extends to us the gift of eternal life. I can celebrate that. I can get behind the power of his resurrection. That's exciting to me. I hope it's exciting to you. The fellowship of his sufferings. Mm, now I'm, I'm thinking about this one a little more. Fellowship sounds good. I like fellowship. I, I just watched Lord of the Rings with my kids lately. The fellowship of the rings. I, I like fellowship. Teamwork. We're going to do this together. I'm not alone. I'm not sure if I like that tag with sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings. Hmm. Something about, and you might remember him, Jesus, talking to his disciples about this. That there is a fellowship in becoming close to Christ. There's a community with one another and with him. But that same closeness to Christ also puts us on the outs with the values of the world. And so there's tension there's necessary, meaningful, very real tension there. We, we talk about in, in sociology, and we see things from different world views, right? We don't see things the same way. We don't interpret the world the same way. And that has a tendency to lead us towards conflict. It's tougher for me to say, okay, I'm excited about this fellowship in your sufferings that I'm happy about, that the world's not going to be all comfortable and pleasant and accommodating and welcoming to me because I'm fighting against the values of it in order to stay close to you. That doesn't sound very exciting, but let's go further. Then he says being conformed to his death. Now let me, let me go ahead and dive into verse 11, even though it's a separate note up there. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Being conformed to his death. Now, we've got to be careful here, and this is, gets really important to us. Are we being told, okay, each one of us needs to die on a cross like Jesus? Well, not in a physical sense. Paul, elsewhere in Romans, particularly Romans 12, talks about being crucified with Christ and that we must be crucified. But he's not talking about in a physical sense, is he? There, there is a conforming to Christ's death that has to do with death to self-will. Christ on the cross gave the perfect example of setting his own will, his own desires aside for the good of another. 
self-sacrifice, in obedience to the whole of God, God the Father, he went to the cross purposefully on our behalf. And it sets an example. We are conformed to his death in that we too crucify the flesh. We hold captive. We put to death the sinful nature that we might obey him, that we might walk in him, that we might have new life in him. We actively, purposely put aside our own wills. We conform our wills to his. That doesn't sound very exciting right now, but let me take you back to the idea of relationship. It's not a relationship of tyranny. And let me take you forward to this next verse, verse 11. We're laying aside these hindrances of the world. We're, we're setting aside our own willfulness, and I love the way that he speaks about it here. It's not, it's not my intelligence. I'm not setting aside my ability or my responsibility to make choices. What is the type of will that I'm setting aside here? I'm setting aside the will of my own spontaneous, my own natural, broken passions and desires. Let's go back to the, our conversation about an athlete. Do athletes get hungry? Yeah. In fact, if you're working hard and exercising a lot, you need food, right? It's important. Some athletes consume huge numbers of calories that would be certainly unhealthy, maybe even damaging to the rest of us because of the amount of exertion that they're doing. Does that mean that they should just eat whatever they feel like? No, that's not how it works. Do athletes enjoy sleep? Some of them, certainly, right? They're people. Some are going to be have tendencies, natural desires, natural tendencies, more towards longer sleep, more sleep, laziness, lethargy than others, right? Does an elite athlete who's expecting to compete and win the prize, do they dare indulge those impulses? No, they've got to regulate themselves. They need to have the right amount of rest. They need to do it wisely and in order, in an orderly fashion, in order to be able to be strong and healthy and compete. They have to be mindful of their passions, of their appetites, of their desires, and what are the long-term effects of them. Does that make sense? We, too, we do not subjugate that God has given us a will, has given us desires, have gives, has given us the ability to have ambitions, but we, we train them. We hold them captive. We instruct ourselves. The old-fashioned word here that we don't like very much is discipline, right? We put ourselves into training camp. Because there's something of a value, verse 11, there's a prize that is worthy, a goal that's worth our attention, worth our hard work, worth denying certain things of ourselves. If it's going to be a hindrance to us, if it's going to hold us back, if it's going to... Uh, keep us from reaching the goal, then it cannot have a place in our lives. It needs to be cut free so that we can run with swiftness and skill and lightness. There's a worthy goal. What does he say the worthy goal is? Very clearly there in verse 11 that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That I might be 
freed from sin. Right? Death, the hold of death. What is death? Death, ultimately, from a biblical perspective, I believe, is separation. Separation from God. We understand the separation sense in the physical sense that we see, that the spirit is no longer with the body. There has been a separation in this body thing that has been so important and that we've never known life personally without is no longer valuable or operating or particularly useful for anything. There's been a separation, a meaningful separation, the spirit from the body. But ultimately, there is a spiritual death, an eternal possibility of separation from God that will not be restored. that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He is speaking literally that Christ has promised to resurrect the dead in the last day, that all who have believed in him would be with him eternally. So he's talking literally resurrecting the spirit, but he is speaking spiritually as well, that there is a escape, that there is a removing of the sting and the hold of spiritual death, that there is unity, that there is coming into glory with Christ. There is Eternal life is what Jesus calls it. Let's press forward. We're to run the race, pressing forward toward the goal. This goal that we've now mentioned. Verse 12, because we are Christ, we press on toward Christ-likeness. There's an interesting way in which Paul says it here. Um, He's saying, I, I don't claim that I've been, uh, perf- that I am perfect myself, but I press on so they may lay hold for which also I was laid hold of by Christ. Okay, let's look at this. I am pressing forward, I am moving in relationship with the Lord. I am laying things aside and getting rid of the hindrances in my life because there is this wonderful goal of unveiled, unbounded, eternal relationship with God available for eternity, right? So I'm pressing towards him. I'm getting to know him. I'm loving him. And I'm doing that. Why? Because he first reached down and grabbed hold of me is what Paul says. I am pressing forward to attain, to grab hold of everything that he has said is for me because he has first reached down into my life and called me up. He's taken hold of me. Do you you see the difference? It's not tyranny, there is this beauty of love and taking the initiative and the first steps and God sacrificing in order that we might be saved and be with him. It's a beautiful thing. Verses 13 and 14, I'm, I'm fitting together. They're two parts of the same whole. We see in verse 13 that the, pa- that the focus is not on the past struggles. He's saying, okay, all those things that I said were, you know, I'm the, Fer- I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews, I'm a Pharisee, I did all these great things that, y- that you all want to say are so great and important, and that's what I should go back to. You might remember there were people upset with Paul that he had abandoned all of that, that that's what's valuable, important, and makes us right. Say, no, I'm, I'm letting go of the past. Now, there's an interesting little piece here that I found as I was going through some commentaries. Not only is he saying that it's not about the past in the sense of what he, um, 
valued in the past. Not only is it not about the past in the sense of going back and, and being um, trapped into misery and guiltiness over our previous sin. God says that when he um, forgives us of our sin, that it is truly gone, and we can have confidence in that. But I loved, I was challenged this week with the commentary that suggested, as he's running forward, he's not even holding on to with a tight grip the successes of the past. Do you get that? I'm not saying that they're not valuable. I'm not saying we deny or reject. But he's not looking back to, boy, wasn't last race so great? Or my last achievement, or how well, or imagine how big our numbers used to be, or how gracious God was there. There's nothing wrong with being aware of what God has done in the past. But the goal is so important that he's fixed that direction. That's verse 14. The focus is on the call, is on the the upward call that God has. What is this? Let me turn my page here. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's pressing on toward holiness. I know that's a scary word to many people because when they hear holiness, they jump back to the list. And they think what Paul just said is, I'm pressing on to this upward call, oh, of being perfect, of doing everything just right. And all of a sudden, the weight comes on to, on to um, works, on to what, how well you've achieved. Is that what he's been saying? Is that the goal? Is that the the upward goal? No, the goal is a holiness, is a connection that comes through knowing Christ and being with him. Is there real change? Is there real transformation? Is there real stopping of sins and bad habits and attitudes and evil things? Yes! That is the wonderful symptom of coming into right relationship with Jesus. Is it important? Of course it is. Is it the focus? No, it's not. We're, run, we're to run the race with victory in mind, keeping our eyes on this goal of perfect harmony with the Lord, of eternal life with him, of allowing him to do the transforming work that we might look more and more like his son. We run the race with confidence that God has victory already for us. That we have already been made more than conquerors, Scripture says. Verse 15 and 16 doesn't let us off the hook. We are to be self-disciplined, as we've already mentioned. It says, let us therefore, as many as are perf perfect in this translation, you might have the word mature, okay? Uh, both are the correct meaning. I know in, in our American language, we have this giant standard for perfect, and you're not allowed to use the word perfect. You know, you're going to offend everybody. Here, it's, it's using the word perfect to talk about completeness or maturity, those of us who are, are mature in Christ um, have this attitude 
And if anything you have, if and if in anything you differ in attitude, God will reveal that to you as well. However, let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. What is he saying? Be disciplined. Be faithful. I love how the old timers used to say it. I, I think there's great wisdom here. So I say it with no no condensation. Condens. Yeah, condensation would be nice. Uh, condensation whatsoever. Um, they used to say to walk in all the light that you have. If God has shown you the truth, if he has called you into relationship with him, be a pursuer after him. And as you are pursuing him, he will help you to grow. He will help you to understand. He will help you to apply. And don't turn back from it. Don't be afraid just because it looks hard or looks like a high standard. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. His spirit is in you. He will help you to overcome the difficulties of unforgiveness, of pridefulness, of selfishness, of rotten attitudes towards the those people in life. All these things and much more. He will help us to overcome if we will not turn away from the difficulty. If we will hold our ground with what we have come to know is right and true and in line with his character and continue to press forward into relationship with him. Not to hide from him. Not to say, ooh, God, that's a big ask. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a seat on the bench on this lap. No, we're in the race. Press forward. Hold on. Trust him. Trust in his training. Trust that he has you. Trust that he will feed you and keep you strong and hold you close. Be disciplined. Don't turn away. He pulls out in verse 17, and I'll do this quickly. He says, look to our example. He, he speaks to himself and his companions, who, his companion who is with him, who was with him when he taught in Philippi. Look to our example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. So I put it this way. Who are our heroes? Who are we looking to? You might, if you're a Bible scholar or remember from you know, church sermons or Sunday school class, you might jump in your mind like I did back to Hebrews chapter 11 that we call the faith chapter and see, oh, those are some heroes of, of people that God highlights who, who had faith. And you might recall in that faith chapter, they're not all, not one of those people were people who ever um, who are people who live totally without sin. Okay? All of them were real people who had real sinful mistakes in their life. Some of them we would look at and go, those were big sinful mistakes. Really? That's supposed to be our hero? Why are they given to us as heroes? Because of their faith. Because they clung to God. Because they turned to Him. Because they let go of their own wills and allowed God to work. Who are our heroes? Who are we looking to as our examples? Now, can I make it harder that's not in the notes? Who are you the hero to? What is the example that you're setting? Are you trying to set an example of works? Are you trying to say, you know, if you're going to be good enough, you need to work really hard like I do and be miserable in life and grumpy all the time and trying to do everything in our, my own strength? Or are you setting an example that says, you know what? If you'll set aside the things that the world says are so important and make time to spend with the Lord... And if you'll put the things that he's showing you into practice, even when it doesn't make a lot of sense, even when it's hard, God will be faithful. 
He'll take care of you. He'll grow you up and give you a perspective that you never saw before. He'll help you be stronger than you ever were before just because you were obedient. What example are you setting? Who are our heroes? I don't like the next part. He goes from, hey, look at us and look to good examples and, and, and refresh yourself, um, encourage yourself with those good examples. He goes from that and he says, now, I got to tell you, you remember I've talked to you before and I'm saying it now with a heavy heart that there are those who do not walk in that kind of example. I, I put it this way. It's possible one can choose to link their own fate to the corruption of this world. What do I mean by that? All of us are born with a sinful spirit. I understand that. Apart from God's good grace, calling us out of that, showing us his way, leading us into relationship with him, we would be lost totally on our own. We would continue to in sin all the way to the destruction of hell. That's our natural state in broken sinfulness. But I don't believe God does leave us there. I believe he is faithful to call into every person's life and give opportunity. We talk about things like even the natural um, um, revelation, the, how God has designed the natural world to draw people's curiosity and attention to himself and show his handiwork and his strength. But I, we do see that there are those who go beyond just the normal human experience of wrestling with sinfulness and seeking after God and trying to do what's right, there are those who become hardened of heart and bitter and purpose themselves after the things of this world after sinfulness, who purposely put themselves in a position of warring with God. Paul draws attention to that and says, beware of this. There is an allurement of sin that takes you deeper and deeper. Um, it made me think of this morning, a, a thought jumped to mind. The old John Bunyan book, Pilgrim's Progress. Any of you familiar with that classic work of literature? I encourage you to read it sometime. It's, it's an allegory, so it's a fun read, especially if you get a hold of a, a modern English translation. We'll help you. Um, in that, one of the places that this, that this young Christian named Pilgrim in the story wanders into is called the Slough of Despondency. It's a deep, mucky, marshy bog. And he's wearing this weight on his shoulders of his own sinfulness. And the guilt of that is this overwhelming weight and he's trying to slug through the muck and the mire of the world is the picture. Be wary. Sinfulness will drag you deeper than you ever intended. Hold you longer than you ever wanted to stay. Cost you more than you were ever willing to give and ultimately lead to your destruction. Paul warns us. Finally, the last two uh, verses here that I'm going to highlight the state of things will not remain this way forever. Hallelujah. Christ will transform and set things right. He takes us back to the idea, not in the words here, but the idea of the race. 
Be disciplined. Do the hard work. Lay off the hindrances. Uh, trust in the one who's instructing you, who's coaching you. It's worthwhile. Keep your eye on the prize. Run light of foot. Right? And then he brings us back to and be of good cheer. Be encouraged. Things aren't going to stay this way. He's going to transform. Let me read how it's written. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. It's not all always going to be this way. There is a, a transformation for our bodies. We don't, un, we don't know all of what this means, but evidently that we are to receive new bodies in whatever form that is, that is something in the likeness of Christ's resurrected body in the, in the resurrection. And so there is a literal sense in which God is doing this. There is the transforming of our bodies to look forward to and a state of conformity with his body. But I love this last statement. The exertion of his power, he has even to subject all things to himself. Christ is actively working to restore that which was lost in the fall. We have reason to be brave, <laughs> to take courage, to run the race wisely and well, because he is the victor, <laughs> and he will give us the victory through him. Let's pray, and then I want to say one more thing as we leave. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. Um, I pray that you would protect us as we go from this place, those of us who have gathered, and go out into the heat and make our way to cooler places. Lord, I pray that you would also send us, from our, <laughs> send us out physically and spiritually with a gritty determination that we're going to run with you, that we're going to run this race without the encumbrances of the old self, the old values, the old sinful habits, the, the values of this world, the muck and mire that would hold us back from pursuing you wholeheartedly, swiftly, strongly, not letting go of who you are. God, truly you are worthy of our everything. And we love you. Amen. As you go, um, oop, I have something for you. I, I know it's a little bit silly in a certain sense, uh, but I ran to the store a little day, the other day, and I got these itty bitty little trophies. Um, now this won't do anything magic in your life. However, as you are leaving, those of you who are here, I would love for you to pick one of these up. And you can make your own choice as adults. But let me encourage you, in your household, to put it in some place where you can see it. And over this next month, I know it's not going to be with you forever and for always. I'm not asking it to, for you to keep this as your favorite keepsake. But would you set it somewhere where you would catch your eye on it from time to time and allow it to be a reminder for you in this month? Prayerfully and meditatively to reflect on how are you running this race? Who are your heroes? 
What are you holding on to? Is it helping you or hindering you and holding you back? Would you evaluate your race? Because God has called you to be an elite athlete for him. Running well, preparing and running in such a way as to attain the prize. He's cheering for you. He's championing you. He wants you to succeed with him. Will you take it with the same seriousness that he does? Maybe this can be of help to you. So these are available on your way out. Lord, bless us as we go. We love you. Amen. Go with the Lord. You are dismissed and you are loved.